knowing that it might cost you something, why is it important to be a transformational leader? Uh, and what we hear time after time uh, are answers like this. Because my values tell me I have to be. Welcome to Worth Quoting, a program sponsored by Florida Community College at Jacksonville, Open Campus. I'm Carol Spaulding, your host, and today we're talking to Dr. Bill Grace, who is a husband, father, and the founder and executive director for the Center for Ethical Leadership in Seattle, Washington. Welcome. Thank you. Um, what does it mean to be an ethical leader, and what's the difference between ethical leadership and leadership? Well, I, in its original sense, I believe that ethical leadership meant ethical leadership, um, or that leadership meant ethical leadership, that when we talked about leadership, it meant uh, trying to bring uh, values and ethics to the equation, um, uh, the benevolent king um, in the, uh, the best of all possible worlds was um, um, the, uh, the whole notion of uh, benevolence was um, the uh, intention, at least, to incorporate ethics into leadership. Um, leadership has uh, become something else, however, in the modern era, and um, some of the research that we've done at the center suggests that uh, really around 1900 through the 19, uh, late 1970s, uh, leadership uh, became something other than um, what it was originally intended to be, and essentially leadership became management, and we can talk more about that in a while. Um, Leadership uh, ultimately was concerned about creating the great society, and management, uh, its ultimate concern is about uh, meeting the bottom line. So uh, we've uh, seen a shift once again uh, in leadership to mean something more than management, but um, uh, ethical leadership, uh, therefore, um, is an important adjective these days. We hope there will come a time again where we won't need that adjective when we say leadership uh, will mean ethical leadership. But ethical leadership is, uh, is a willful intention uh, to ensure that goodness and values is a part of the leadership equation uh, and essentially a commitment to the common good. Um, what might be helpful here is uh, just a, a brief talk about how do we, how do we get there. Um, there is a... Um, theorist, uh, his name is James Rest, who talks about moral development. If I'd like to become a moral person, what's the process? Uh, and he says that there are four stages or four steps. Uh, the first step is moral sensitivity. And that question is, am I aware that there's a dilemma in my midst? Uh, it's very possible to be in the midst of a dilemma and not know uh, that we're in the midst of one. Uh, that's what explains, uh, from my perspective, um, how the Holocaust happened in the midst of uh, German neighborhoods. Uh, there was uh, concentration camps and, um, and brutality being exercised just down the street, and many German citizens simply said they didn't know. Um, I believe them. I believe that it is possible to so psychologically numb ourselves to the problems of the day that we can be in the midst of very significant dilemmas and at some level claim that we don't know. Uh, so the first task in trying to be an ethical person is to engage in moral sensitivity, and that's to open our hearts, uh, to open our psyches to some of the pain and discomfort of the world. Um, you know, it's difficult to see uh, pictures of hungry children. It's difficult uh, to see the brutality that was going on in Rwanda. Um, uh, it's very difficult uh, to uh, be an eyewitness of the pain of the world, uh, but it's the first task of citizenship is, is to recognize uh, the pain and injustice in our midst. Um, once we've become sensitive to the issues around us, the next two steps are moral reasoning and moral choosing. In moral reasoning, uh, I simply uh, become aware of the choices that I have. If I meet a homeless person on the street, I have a number of choices. I can walk past that person. Um, I can reach into my pocket and give them a quarter or I can give them five bucks, or I could uh, cancel an appointment and take them to lunch, or I could go down to my state legislature and advocate for change in public policy for the sake
sake of homeless people. So I have a whole series of choices. Um, in moral choosing, among those choices, I, I choose and I uh, also reflect why. And the why of my choice uh, reveals some of who I am. If I um, wind up giving the homeless person a buck and answer why, uh, and it's because I was in a hurry and I was busy um, and that's all I had in my pocket, that says something about uh, expediency in my life being a value. Um, if I look at my watch and I decide I'm taking this person out to lunch and I'm going to spend an hour and call my office and cancel an appointment and get to know this person and share a little bit of human kindness, that also says something about who I am. Um, but uh, the first three steps, um, sensitivity, reasoning, and choosing, are essentially intellectual steps. I can do all of those in my head. Uh, the fourth step, moral action, which is really what um, I've been very interested in for the last 20 years or so and what the Center for Ethical Leadership is interested in. Moral action uh, requires me to do something. It requires me to walk my talk. Um, Moral reasoning, uh, and what we've discovered is that a person's capacity for moral reasoning may have little or nothing to do with their willingness to engage in moral action. Uh, put another way, just because I know the right thing to do, it's no guarantee I'm going to do the right thing. Uh, so ethical leadership is a commitment to try to not only be sensitive, um, but to try to incorporate those sensitivities uh, into my decision making. Hmm. Well, do we all know the right thing to do? Would we agree on what the right thing is to do? Let's take the homeless person. Yeah. I mean, people say don't give them any money because it just encourages them, and you know there are some risks involved with this, and there's a whole lot of reasons not to do a lot of things. Uh, the answer to the first question, I, I don't think we would agree what is the right thing to do. Um, and my first interest is to have uh, all citizens, all elected officials, uh, arrive at their point of view from an informed perspective, from an active engagement of the uh, issue with their values. Have they taken time to really deeply reflect on the issue in the context of their values, um, as opposed to watching polls and wondering what the electorate wants to hear? Cornell West uh, says that we have too many elected officials these days who are content to be uh, temperature gauges, and they need to be thermostats. Uh, we don't need people to tell us what temperature it is in the room. We need people with enough courage to set agendas and to either turn the heat up or turn the heat down, depending on uh, the issue of the day. Um, but uh, you raise uh, a good issue, and it's what I call service, rightly understood. I believe that there's uh, at least three ways to engage in service. Uh, all of them are good, and all of them are important. Um, but if we uh, engage in service at the deepest level, then I believe we'll make different leadership choices. Uh, the first level of service is, I see it as service as charity. Uh, that's me meeting the homeless person on the street and giving them a dollar. Um, and uh, going on my way, um, and I don't know if that person bought food or bought alcohol, um, but you know, if the person bought food and it put something in their belly that day, uh, it was probably at some level a very good thing to do. Uh, and charity has been an important institution in this culture, and it has shaped many fine institutions. Uh, but at some level, charity is not enough, and we know that, especially if you've been the recipient of charity. Um, there's a distastefulness about it um, at times. Um, so the next level of service is compassion. And um, we're still very focused on the poor person, in this case the homeless person. Um, but the question is, um, you know, what would be a deeper response? Uh, compassion, again, I, the roots of words are revealing here. Compassion means to suffer with. If I have compassion on the other, it means I know a little bit about their story, probably. Uh, that instead of giving them a dollar, I probably went to lunch with them. Um, and I know a little bit more and might be surprised at this person on the street and um, might be able to say, as I leave that person there, but for the grace of God, go I, and recognize that their story it might not be that much unlike my own. Uh, uh, except for a couple lucky breaks here and there. And I can look at that person with different eyes. And maybe their story uh, encourages me to do more than just um, um, you know, uh, give a dollar uh, to the next homeless person I see. Uh, but compassion um, is also uh, limited in its ability to affect culture uh, because I believe it's still short-term focused. And so let me tell this story. Um, I'd like us um, 
to imagine that uh, before we left home this morning that we inadvertently left the kitchen sink running. Um, and the whole time that we've been here, uh, the dishcloth, by the way, that in my home we drape across the faucet to let it dry, the dishcloth has fallen in the sink and has been stopping the water from draining. So the whole time we've been here, the water has been building up and building up and is now lapping over the sink and it's on the floor and it's seeping into the carpet and up the wicker furniture. And, um, uh, you know, I'm feeling a little bit anxious to get home now myself. Uh, the question is, you know, what would you do when you got home? You go turn off the water. Go turn off the water. Well, that makes you a social prophet. See, because I, I think that the answer, if we look at cultural behavior, is that we mop the floors. Um, homeless people continue to spill over into our communities, so we build more shelters. Hungry people continue uh, to arrive, uh, and so we build bigger food banks. Um, uh, teenagers continue to get pregnant and we look for uh, more and more programs to house teenage um, young women who are pregnant. Um, but what does it mean to shut off the water in relation to homelessness? What does it mean to shut off the water in relation to hunger? What does it mean to shut off the water in relation to teenage pregnancy? I believe that what we're talking about at that point is service as justice. So that uh, Dr. King was not only concerned about whether or not people would be treated politely on buses, whether they would be, um, uh, people would listen to their stories. The question was, did they have a right to sit at the front of the bus? Uh, um, and that was only a metaphor for did they have a right to be at the front of culture. Um, and uh, Dr. King's commitment um, uh, was that service as charity was not enough, uh, that we had to become committed to service as justice. And that informs a particular type of leadership. That informs uh, what um, James McGregor Burns has called transformational leadership. Uh, the alternative uh, to transformational leadership is transactional leadership, which simply means to uh, maintain the status quo for a chosen few. Uh, and that's essentially management. If, um, if I'm working for you and uh, you're the uh, owner of a company and you bring me into your corporation, it's probably to make your corporation more successful. Whatever you have, you'd like more of, uh, more market share, um, uh, more sales, more productivity. More for less. More for less. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if I'm a good manager, if I'd like a bonus or if I'd like a raise, then the purpose of management is to help ensure that you're going to get what you want. Um, and if we see the pie as a finite pie, as the natural world would tell us, then that means that uh, somebody else is getting less if, if we're getting more. Transformational leadership um, seeks almost the opposite. It seeks to change the status quo for the common good. And I'm fond of asking people, if I might, uh, could you name a couple transformational leaders, people who you think tried to change the status quo uh, for the common good um, mm. over the last 2,000 years? I, would, I guess I would choose Mother Teresa at the moment because mm -hmm. I felt like she, she um, lived her values and made a huge impact in the world. And let's see, another one. Ooh. Well, Gandhi, certainly. Okay. These people are close to saints, though. I mean, they're, they're really exceptional. Well, I'd like to come back and, and talk about the, the notion of uh, sainthood and how I think that's um, not a helpful mm -hmm. process for us. Um, but when, I, uh, when we ask the question, can you name some transformational leaders in the last 2,000 years, some of the names that typically come up are um, Martin Luther King and Gandhi, um, uh, just to name a couple. Uh, and so the question is, what happened to those people? <laughs> Not good. Not good. Well, they, both of these people died, I guess, of old age. But a lot of times, people are martyred by their, for right. their, I guess, for their positions or their lives. And not all transformational leaders are killed. I mean, that's the good news. Uh, some of them are just tortured. Mm -hmm. You know, Stephen Biko, mm -hmm. who uh, tried to engineer a um, um, sharing of power in Southern Africa before uh, Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. um, some transformational leaders are excommunicated by the Catholic Church uh, for 455 years and forgiven uh, after that because they thought the earth revolved around the sun. Uh, Galileo. Some transformational leaders are um, intentionally lied about or forgotten about. Um, 
um, we ask the question, who is the Moses of her people uh, in this culture? And the answer, of course, is Harriet Tubman. Uh, Harriet Tubman was born a slave in the South and escaped to the North, um, but went back to the South uh, 17 times. Um, um, as a conductor on the Underground Railroad, one of the things she was most proud of was that she never lost a passenger. Well, I don't know about you, but her story was never told in my history books. Um, a woman in the uh, Midwest, her name is Rennie Golden, she's written a book entitled Dangerous Memories, and she believes that these memories are dangerous because they would inspire us to become critics and shapers of culture, um, and so that we don't tell these stories. Uh, but the real question is, knowing that it might cost you something, why is it important to be a transformational leader? Uh, and what we hear time after time uh, are answers like this. Because my values tell me I have to be. Uh, because I want to be a person of integrity. Because I want to be able to look my children and my grandchildren in, in the eye and say that I tried, that I did this. Um, I want to say that um, when I had a shot to be at the helm, that I tried to do the right thing. Um, so um, transformational leadership um, is also uh, then about courage. And again, we have to ask the question, where does courage come from? Um, but um, transformational leadership um, is what our culture needs. Uh, we have to ask ourselves again, what institutions are promoting this? Um, I love higher education, but I'm a critic of higher education because I think that higher education has been content for too long to uh, create more managers and far fewer leaders. It passes on the values as opposed to helping you shape your own and move on with them or have some sort of action. They haven't told those stories either. Let's talk a little bit more about this common good idea uh, and how that works for leaders because managers may not be looking at the common good, they're looking at the bottom line. And we look at the idea of stewardship and how this can reframe how we, we make some choices. Mm -hmm. I, I think stewardship is a very important word for us uh, at this point in our lives together. Um, stewardship, uh, one of the um, definitions of stewardship is the management of the household in the owner's absence. Um, the question that that brings up for me is uh, who's the owner? And I believe that uh, that question is either a philosophical one or a theological one. And I believe that they're both uh, uh, legitimate choices. If it's a philosophical one, a person might answer, well, um, the owner of the household are generations that aren't here yet. And so how do we become more sensitive to uh, spend the natural resources uh, so that there's a, a sufficient available for generations uh, yet to come? Uh, if it's a theological question, then the answer uh, for me is God. And if this is God's world, uh, then as steward, um, how am I to act in this world? Um, uh, I'm fond of asking people the question, you know, raise your hand if you've seen a luggage rack on a hearse. Um, and um, for the most part, people haven't seen one. Well, I think it's a big hint. Uh, if there's no luggage racks on hearses, then maybe we really can't take it with us. And could it be then that a good leave life is not about what we take with us, but what we leave behind, not only as good stewards, but one of the things we can leave behind um, is a legacy, is a story. Um, and I believe that um, finding, again, motivation for doing that, a culture uh, that we live in uh, that is uh, significantly informed by the market economy um, suggests other incentives are important. Uh, what we drive, where we live, uh, what we wear. But again, if we can't take those things with us, then are there other incentives that have deeper, uh, more heartfelt meaning? Um, stewardship is also connected to citizenship. If, if stewards are concerned themselves uh, with the household, uh, citizenship simply means to be a member of a household. Uh, so the common good then is trying to ensure uh, as stewards and citizens uh, that the resources of the household are shared with all, especially the least fortunate. And that a good life um, is about creating systems and institutions that really do hold up the dignity and the, uh, the importance of every human life, not only in this country, but in countries around the world that, uh, where the citizens of those countries suffer more than probably the poorest citizens in this culture. Well, our values here, which seem to be promoted by the media um, and this commercialism and consumption um, are 
you know, it sounds like we're missing the boat now. You're trying to make a really major change in how people think and make choices. Is that right? I, I believe so, you know, and I, I think that the media is an important tool uh, to keep us asleep uh, at the wheel. Um, in Rome, um, you know, the uh, Roman Senate wondered how they would um, keep Roman citizens from becoming concerned about what the Roman uh, Empire was doing to other parts of the world, believing that if the Roman citizens knew, um, their natural human compassion would um, sort of uh, get into gear and they would become critics of the Roman culture, the Roman Empire's um, sort of presence in other parts of the world. And so when asked the question, what, we can, what can we do to keep the citizens occupied, the answer was bread and circuses. You know, keep them fed and keep them entertained. And I believe that the entertainment industry in our culture has a lot to do with uh, keeping us from asking critical questions of culture. Uh, the media, on the other hand, is a very powerful tool. Um, the more um, we can use media for opportunities like this to help people to wrestle with significant questions of the day. I really believe that uh, even though we're asking for some significant change to happen, uh, I believe that the odds are on the side of um, ethics and leadership because I, I trust the human heart. Um, um, you know, Dr. King believed that the entire universe bent towards justice. That's the only um, um, view of the world that would allow someone to sit at a lunch counter and to be struck uh, both by fists and by clubs believing that innocent suffering is redemptive and that citizens watching the innocent suffering of others would cause people to rise up with a sense of indi indignation and say something needs to change. Well that's a real trust in the human heart, the goodness of the human heart uh, and I have that same trust. I don't believe that the universe is a neutral place. I believe that it bends towards love. I believe that it bends towards justice and uh, just a little bit of a nudge just a little bit of encouragement uh, from uh, even a handful of citizens uh, can make significant changes in communities sociologists tell us that only eight percent of any group heading off in a new direction is a movement mm -hmm. uh, so you know what is eight percent uh, of um, the institution someone works in or eight percent um, of a community or a city or a county eight percent of that group moving in a new direction is a movement all right so so you You've got some people who are martyrs on the media, but the people who are inflicting the pain, where are they coming from? Uh, probably fear. Um, uh, the fear of change, uh, the fear that the pie is, is not big enough, that if I give up my share of the pie, um, is there going to be enough for me? Um, hatred is also a learned behavior. Um, uh, but I believe that um, you know love is more powerful and that um, uh, and that um, we can change culture. But it, again, it will require us to bring values into the workplace and into our schools and to uh, be um, unabashed in our willingness to talk about uh, issues of love and compassion and justice uh, in our schools and to begin to shape young hearts and minds about a culture that is very possible. Right. We don't have much time to finish up. I just wanted to mention the talk to you about the, the symbolic meaning of uh, some of these values and what kind of values you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that, that uh, people obviously understand is the symbol for, for love which I guess is universal but I'm not sure. Is it universal? Well, um, we have um, uh, done a little research um, in this whole notion of uh, symbology and have asked people to come up with uh, symbols for values because it's helpful when we ask people to create visions of the community that symbols are helpful. Um, and uh, symbols um, uh, are very powerful tools. Some of the symbols that have come up when we talk about love, people typically uh, think of a heart. Uh, we talk of peace and uh, people might think of, of dove, uh, talk about justice and oftentimes people uh, will draw the scales of justice. What's been interesting is when people choose integrity as a value and have struggled to come up with a symbol for it, uh, what we've discovered is at the center is that we really don't have a, a symbol for the word integrity. Um, and I believe that that's very telling. Uh, what does it mean that a culture does not have a symbol for the word uh, integrity? Now we have a symbol for money uh, that we readily recognize. Uh, we have a symbol for love. But the fact that we don't have a recognizable symbol for integrity that we could recognize in any city in the nation um, suggests possibly, uh, could it be 
that we don't have a symbol for integrity because it's not a cultural value. Uh, and if you are interested in maintaining systems and not promoting change, then to not encourage integrity is one of the ways in which um, that might happen. Uh, but I, I want to be careful not to be a conspiracist here. Um, I, I believe that uh, in the power of integrity, and what I'm interested in is asking communities to come up with their own symbol for integrity. Um, and then to uh, encourage that in the schools, encourage that in religious institutions, uh, encourage that in corporate and government life, um, and to have a community uh, embrace a symbol that could inform all of our lives. So in just reviewing in the last minute that we have those four stages that you have to work through, um, integrity would be where on that? Well, the four stages, moral sensitivity, moral reasoning, choosing, and action, probably across the board. You know, it might be a theme that runs across all of them, mm -hmm. because if I'm going to have integrity in my reflection, then the likelihood of me looking at the deeper issue and not just being content to mop floors becomes um, more significant. If I have integrity in my reasoning, um, I'll begin to look at a broader array of choices than what I first thought were available to me. If I have integrity in my choosing, I'm likely to choose that which will be more satisfying for me in the long run and better uh, for the culture. And finally, if I have integrity, my actions are more likely to walk my talk. That sounds good. So here's an invitation to walk your talk, right? Thank you very much. We've been with Dr. Bill Grace from the Center for Ethical Leadership, and this is Carol Spalding with Open Campus at Florida Community College. Thank you for being with us.